welcome again. Welcome to Sven Schatter, who is joining us tonight from Munich. And Sven is a software developer at Lively Apps, working on popular Confluence apps like Pocket Query, Task Reminder, and Hide Elements since 2017. And recently, he received the Atlassian Marketplace Vendor of the Year 2019 Developer Contributor Award due to his contributions to the Atlassian developer community. So uh, thank you for that. And without further ado, over to you, Swen, and how to build a data integration framework for Confluence. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, thanks. Thanks for the introduction. I'm um, just going to turn on my screen sharing real quick here. So, uh, screen sharing is working. Very good. OK, so as you just heard, I'm Sven. I'm a developer at Lively Apps. And um, yeah, to be honest, if you already heard of us, you're probably really active in the Atlassian ecosystem because Lively Apps was just founded uh, this January. And before that, we were part of Scandio, one of the bigger Atlassian solution partners in Germany. But now we're a full marketplace vendor with a handful of people spread across Munich and Vancouver. And we're just super excited to be able to fully focus on making great, app, uh, great apps now. And you're likely going to hear more from us uh, in the future. <laughs> so my talk is titled, Let's Build a Data Integration uh, Framework for Confluence. And for this, I first want to talk about what data integration actually is. And then we're going to uh, define a data integration framework for Confluence. And in the end, I'm going to show you Pocket Query, which is one of our apps and implements this idea. So um, what's data integration? Uh, usually in an organization, there will be several IT systems that hold different kinds of data. For example, there could be a CRM that contains information about your customers, a time tracking system, a ticket system like Jira, or even just simple databases that contain your products, sales data, or other data, depending on what your company does. Now, the basic idea behind data integration is that you want to have a single easy way to access all this data from one place. And of course, Confluence is a great place to do this. Chances are you are probably even doing this already to a certain extent. And so you might think to yourself, uh, data integration, is that just a marketing buzzword? Uh, but actually, data integration has been a popular research area in computer science for many decades now. And there are several papers about this topic dating back to even the 80s and 90s. If you look into this research, you will find that two main approaches to being data and uh, to doing data integration have become popular with one being data warehousing and the other one being data mediation. So some of you might have already heard of data warehousing before. In this approach, the data in your different systems is federated into one single system. This system becomes your data warehouse. So basically, we're transforming multiple sources into a single store. Using that store, you can then create a sample application or a simple application that makes this data avail available to your users. This concept has a few disadvantages. For one, you, of course, need a place to store all of this data. And that place might become very large or might need to be very large. And then you need a way to get your data from your sources into your warehouse. Uh, so you will likely need to run some kind of job that does this. And depending on the frequency of this job, the data that's in your warehouse right now might be out of date at certain times. Uh, OK, so let's look at the data mediation approach. The main difference here is that we aren't storing any data. Instead, we are putting a mediator in front of our data sources that provides an abstracted real-time interface to our application. So this will basically route through the requests to each source every time the application tries to access any data. And this, of, uh, this approach, of course, also has some disadvantages. But for the data integration framework that we want to build for Confluence, uh, this makes the most sense. This is essentially because it is more lightweight as we don't have to store any data in Confluence. 
And also with data warehouses, there are certain maintenance aspects that we just don't have with a mediator. And using this approach, the data that we display in Confluence will always be up to date. And this is usually what we want anyway. Okay, so we want to do data integration using a mediator. Um, at this point, we should talk about what our mediator should look like. Uh, since pages are the main unit of Confluence, it would be cool if we were able to use our mediator from within a page, right? And Confluence macros are a great way to do this. Let's say I put a data integration macro into my page and I somehow tell it to pull some data out of some external system. When viewing the page, the macro could then show a table or maybe a chart that is rendered from my data. Uh, that's the idea. So there are, of course, already macros that do things like this. For example, the Jira macro uh, is one of those. You simply put a Jira macro into a Confluence page, tell it what issues to search, and when you view the page, a list of issues is loaded from Jira. And also, basically, any type of connector app from the Atlassian Marketplace also functions like this. But usually, these only work with a single type of system. And having a flexible framework that kind of just works with almost anything would, of course, be much nicer, right? So how can we make this possible? Essentially, there are three main questions that must always be answered every time you want to use our macro. And these are, where should the data be pulled from? what data should be pulled, and how should the data be presented on our page. We want users to answer the where question by giving us a data source. A data source is basically a configuration entity that represents an external system. In our framework, um, this could either be a REST API or a JDBC database. And with these two types, we're covering a really broad range of systems. Uh, most modern systems expose a REST API. And if they don't, we can probably access the underlying database or the system actually is a database. So <laughs> we can just access it. And of course, data sources should also contain authentication details so that we can successfully talk to the system, right? Great, so a user could now say, uh, please fetch data from this data source and we would know what to do. But then we have to ask, ask, well, what data to fetch? And in this case, the user can answer by giving us a query. Uh, for JDBC databases, this is pretty intuitive, right? Because there we can just use SQL. Uh, a query can just be a select statement in that case. For REST APIs, it's a bit less intuitive, but also quite simple. In the data source, we specify the base URL that points to our REST API. Uh, and as a query, we can then specify an endpoint by providing a path. So in this case, the query would be to load some issues. Uh, awesome. We now have a way to know exactly what data should be pulled from where. Uh, but how do we display it on the page now? To be able to show our data on the page, we need a way to transform a data into HTML. And a common way to do this is to use a templating language. Basically, you want to write HTML with placeholders in it, and our data is then put into these placeholders. In Confluence, there's al uh, already a templating language that is widely used. Uh, it's called Velocity, and if you're a Confluence administrator, uh, you probably have already worked with it. For example, it's used for user macros, and Confluence also heavily uses it internally to render the Confluence user interface. Um, it's really powerful, but without getting in too much detail, uh, it simply allows us to render a data exactly how we need it. So, for example, as a table or as a chart. Okay, um, that's all we need, but how does this come together now? Um, here, can, he, here you can see kind of our data integration pipeline and how this would work for someone that wants to use our framework or rather our macro. Uh, first, they insert our macro into the page. And then they choose a query that should be uh, executed when the macro is executed. Um, when the query is run, 
it fetches data from our data source. And this data is then piped into our template, gets rendered into HTML, and is displayed on the page. So that's the theory. And uh, let's actually use this now, because as I said, uh, we have an app called Pocket Query, which is basically an implementation of this idea. So here we are on the Atlassian Marketplace. I hope you can see it. <laughs> Um, we just have to go to the top rated apps for Confluence and there you will find it in number five currently. As you can see, it's also a staff pick and it's installed on about 1300 instances, uh, which accounts to about 1 million end users. Um, I have Pocket Query already installed on my local Confluence, so I'm going to log in. And as you can see here, uh, Pocket Query is installed. Now, um, when Pocket Query is installed into my instance, um, as a Confluence administrator, I get access to the Pocket Query administration. I can find the link to it here when I click on my profile picture. And here you can see exactly the concept that we had before. We, had, we have our data sources, our queries, and our templates. Uh, so, as it already tells us, uh, we should start by adding a data source. So, um, I'm going to click here to create a new data source and let's start by giving it a name. Um, I have a locally running um, database uh, which contains information about the world. So, some cities and countries and stuff like that. So, I'm going to call it world database. Um, after that, I can choose the type of this database or this data source. And as you can see, there are several types that we can choose from, the ones that we just talked about. Um, I'm going to choose JDBC as I have a Postgres database here. And next, I need to provide a URL that points to this database. Um, I have pasted it here, and um, this is basically where the database is running. Uh, this is standard standard JDBC. And Pocket Query also needs to know what driver to use uh, to connect to my database. Since this is a Postgres database, Pocket Query is able to automatically recognize the driver. So I just clicked in here and it automatically uh, recognized the driver from the URL. For, for other databases, um, you might need to put that in yourself. Um, now I just need to put in the user and the password and we can do a small connection test before we save the data source. So as you can see, connection was successful. If there was something wrong with, um, let's say my authentication, it would tell me down here. So I would know before saving the data source. So let's test again. It's all green and save the data source. All right. Um, if you go to our dashboard now, we see that we have one data source and the next step is of course to create a query, right? So I'm going to create a, no, uh, a new query here. And for the start, uh, let's just have a look at some countries that are in this database. As you can see, the world DB is already selected as a data source uh, because it's the only one available. And for a template, we are using the default template. This is very nice because this will just render a table for us and we don't have to do anything at all. We can simply insert our statement and we don't have to look at all these options down here for now. Save the query. And when we create a page, we can now use the Pocket Query macro. So let me insert the Pocket Query macro really quick. Um, we are now at this step here. So we can now choose a query and then execute it and view the results in the page. So my country's query is already selected because it's the only one available. And I insert this macro. I have to give the page a title so that I can save it. And it's published. You see that there's a lot of data in this page now, which is pretty cool. Okay, so I'm just going uh, to show you how the same works with a REST API. Um, I have a REST API prepared here 
well, kind of a REST API. It's basically just an endpoint that returns user information, a list of users. And um, this would be pretty common. This could be, for example, our CRM. Um, so if I want to use this, I have to create a new data source, of course. Uh, so let me do that. And as I just said, uh, this will be our CRM REST API. Um, I have to choose some REST type since my endpoint doesn't use any authentication. I can just go with REST basic and not put in a user or password. And then I'm going to take the base URL and put it as an URL for my data source. Um, I can also test connection and everything is green. Awesome, I can save it. So now I have to create a query to be able to get this data into my confluence as well. And doing so, I have to first uh, choose my CRM REST API. And uh, as I said, this would be a list of my customers. So let's just call this query customers. And I have to now put in this path and it will be appended to the base URL. So this is my query, this is my endpoint. And we can also use uh, the default template for this. So let's go ahead and save this and create a new page as well. Uh, so let's call this page customers and insert the pocket query macro. And this time we actually have to choose our customers query. And as we can see, this is now also in the page, exactly the data from here. But um, there is one slight difference. Um, as you can see here, this looks kind of weird, right? Um, this is because in the, in the actual data that we get from the REST API, there are nested objects in my user objects. And um, these are not really easy to display nicely. So for REST APIs, we have to add in an extra step. Uh, since the data that we get back from REST APIs could be uh, anything, could be unformatted, we need to unpack it or whatever, we need to introduce a step so that we can process this data before we reach it into the template. And for this, we want to use a converter. So let me show you how that works. Um, I just go to the Pocket Query administration, uh, switch to the converter tab, and create a new converter. Um, in my case, let's say I want to unpack the, just the user ID and the name and also the company, the company name of my customer. So I create a new converter and give it a name. Um, I'm just going to call it customer's company converter. And a converter is just a JavaScript function. So there's um, this default converter here that uh, explains what it does exactly. We can go ahead and delete this because I've already prepared a converter. And what this does is it accepts the JSON, it parses it, and then it goes through all users and basically unpacks the ID, the name, and the company name. And as you can see, for this one, it reaches into the company object to get the name. So this could of course be used to filter the response or um, change the response in every kind of way for REST APIs, where you don't have the same flexibility that you have with SQL. Okay, I have created this converter now, and now I only need to apply it to my customer's query. I can do that here. And if I save this and reload the page, you will see that there are now only the ID, the name, and the company name here. So with converters, I'm just very flexible and I can use all REST APIs, even with the default template. Okay, um, now Pocky Query is a really old app. Uh, it's actually been on the marketplace since 2013. And of course, these are not the only features that such an old app uh, brings with it. For, um, for example, one problem would be that since this data is dynamic, I'm not able to search it in the Confluence search, right? So if I copy this company name and try to search it, nothing shows up. Um, for this, you can go to your query in the Pocket Query administration 
and actually enable this checkbox. This will add the results to the Confluence search. And um, if we reload the page and give it a few seconds, we should now be able to find this page in the Confluence search, even though the content is fully dynamic. So if I put this here now, you can see that we can find the page now using the Confluence search, which is awesome. <laughs> And um, of course, there's also a way to make this whole querying experience more dynamic. So uh, let me create a new query to show you what I mean. Um, I want a new query that goes to my world database again. And I'm not going to give it a name just yet, but let's say I had a query like this. So this query basically gets the five most populated countries for the continent North America. Um, um, but what if I want this query, not only for North America, but maybe for South America and Asia and Europe as well, would I have to create a query for each of these continents now? Uh, of course you don't. <laughs> In Poggy Query, you can just add a parameter here. So you start a parameter with a column and then you give it a name, for example, in our case, continent. And now I have to give a name to the query as well so that I can save it. And what this allows us to do is to specify this value in the macro browser. So I'm going to save this query and create another page where we can put this one in. Uh, Let's call it countries of continent, just like the query. And here's the pocket query macro again. Uh, let me select the query. You see now that we have this continent box down here we, where we can specify the value. So here we could go ahead and say, I want to see all uh, countries or the five most populated countries of Asia. Or I could change this to North America. and reload this. So this is pretty cool. This gives me more flexibility. Uh, but now I can even allow the user in the view mode of the page to, to do this. And for this, I simply have to enable this uh, checkbox here, load macro dynamically. What this does is um, basically the query would be executed while the page is being loaded. And with this checkbox, um, the query will only be executed after the page is loaded. So this is also a performance benefit. And I can use the change params template down here. And if I reload this now, or actually let me insert the macro into the page and publish the page, the user now gets kind of like the search bar, right? So they can just put everything in here. Now they can say, oh, uh, show me the countries for South America or show me the countries for uh, Europe. Um, so you have, with just a few clicks, created a interface for your users, which allows them to search through your REST API or through your database, and it took no effort at all. <laughs> okay, um, we haven't even uh, looked at templates yet, and you might think to yourself already, okay, um, I have this population count here and uh, the countries here, wouldn't it be cool to display this as a chart? And of course, this is also possible with Pocket Query. Um, I simply have to create a new template for this, right? So if I click on templates and add a new template, um, I have to give it a name first. And we already said that we wanted to do a chart. Um, now I could, I could look at the default template. Yeah. If I click on this button, it inserts the code that the default template is using and this uh, renders HTML. This is pretty useful and this works for tables really well. But um, for the case uh, when, when we want to do charts, uh, um, JavaScript is a better way to do it um, because it's more flexible and we don't have to write everything down here. Um, Poggy Query comes with a JavaScript API that basically wraps the Google Charts API. So this is all you have to do um, to use this. And you just have to specify what type of chart you want. So let's say I want a column chart, for example. Um, I just, uh, I saved this template and I now have to apply it to my query. 
um, where is it? Countries of continent and choose the chart template, save. If I now go to my page again, um, I can change this and this will already be applied. Um, you see, we have a chart and it took no effort at all. You can do the same for North America. And I can load in charts directly from my database into my conference page. Um, okay, of course, there are also other charts available, for example, the pie chart. And I could also pass some more advanced options um, to this function, but for now, let's keep it simple. Um, we don't really have the time to go through all of that. And I saved this, so let's just look at the pie chart as well. So as you can see, this is now a pie chart. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, okay, so just let me look at the time really quick. It's about 25 minutes. Okay, that's, that's pretty, pretty good. Um, maybe, maybe one more thing. Um, so in the templates, there's also a API that you can use. Um, I have the link to it here. Uh, this is from our documentation. Um, in our velocity templates, these are all the objects that you can use. And down here, you can see there's also a helper function, which allows you to execute other queries from within your template or even um, down here, you can see, you can even execute other macros from within a Pocky free template. So what you could do is you could do something like load in a list of Jira issues, and then for each Jira issue, execute another query that goes to another data source and also display data from that. Um, I actually have a small GIF um, in our documentation. I don't have the example in my instance right now. But here you can see, this is a table of issues. Um, here, test one, test two, and so on. And if you click on a button, a dialog opens, and this is actually another query. So just wanted to show you this really quick. It's, it's just awesome. It's crazy what you can do with it. And in support, we often get questions like, uh, can I do X with Pocket Query? Is this possible with Pocket Query? And it's just so cool that we can almost always answer these questions with yes and here's how. <laughs> so there's just one slide left now and it's this slide. Um, yeah, I, I hope that I could bring you, I was able to bring you the, the concept of data integration a bit closer and um, that next time when you think, oh, uh, it would be really cool if I was able to see this data in my confluence that you might remember Pocket Query and give it a try. <laughs> okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. Um, we have questions, two questions um, in the Q&A box. The first question is, and let me just read the first one while I promote everybody to panelists. Can the query parameters handle typos? Can the, I'm not exactly sure. Um, where they would handle typos? Like, do you mean in the actual name of the parameters or do you mean in uh, the values? Find, uh, where is he? Did he leave? No, he's not here anymore. Uh, let me just promote, uh, that's okay. Let's move on and look <laughs> ask the next one. Um, oh, uh, no, I think I probably know the answer. I think it's probably uh, in, in the value. So of course in, um, that it depends on your data source, let's say. So uh, with a REST API, it probably wouldn't be possible because in a REST API, you're just passing the value as part of the path. And if your REST API doesn't support handling typos, then it doesn't work. But if you have a database, you can of course use the like syntax and put percentage, uh, uh, percent signs around the parameter um, and then it of course can have a handle typos because the database um, allows to search for similar strings or at least parts of the strings and stuff like that. I hope okay. that makes sense. <laughs> yeah. And um, second question, can you also parameter the converter? So far it looks best to have a converter for the full rest response and filter it with table filter. 
Yeah, um, so you in the converter, you actually have access to part of the context. So um, all the query parameters that are passed to the query, you can also use or access in the converter. And you also have access to um, a few more other things. So there's one feature that we didn't talk about. There's also white cards. So you can, um, these are basically parameters that start with an at. And for example, one parameter would be the username. So you could just put the username into your query and it would be inserted automatically. So that is all also available in converters and templates to use. Okay, does this answer the question? Uh, not quite. So, so I was I was thinking the um, for 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 us like the the users like write their uh, macros. So they they configure their macros. So this is why why I'm asking. So if they if we need to put in like converters for every single part, they still need to open a ticket for us in order to uh, put the source in, of course, and then uh, write the converter at least, right? Um, so um, I'm not exactly sure. Um, so the Pocket Query Administration can only be accessed by Pocket ad uh, Query Administrators or by Confluence Administrators. So. I'm not sure um, if the users in your sense would even be able to write queries anyway. Um, that, would be, that would need to be done by someone that has access to the Pocket Query Administration. And then they also have the ability to write converters themselves. Um, or do you mean you want to write a converter that is more general, uh, general and works for uh, several queries. Is that, is that what you mean? Yeah, the later, uh, because like um, the, <laughs> okay. our users like put in like every, every possible combination, what you may think of and what you don't think of. Uh, and you, of course, like we don't want to touch like every single use case. Uh, mm -hmm. So we want to enable them in order to uh, put in their data from their source uh, with the minimal impact that we have. Okay. Yeah. So there, there's two things that this depends on. So of course it depends on what kind of data your uh, REST API returns, right? So if your REST API always just returns flat data with no nested objects, then you don't even need a converter at all. Um, and then secondly, it kind of depends on, yeah, on how good you are at programming or, I mean, we could help you in support, but <laughs> Uh, depending on what your uh, API returns, on what kind of, uh, of data it returns, you could probably write a general converter that just uh, flattens all objects. So even if there are um, nested objects, you can probably just um, pull them out and flatten the object so that you always get a clean table. That's, that's possible, yeah, because it's just JavaScript. You could just program that, yeah. Ah, okay, cool, thanks. <laughs> Okay, other maybe, questions? Maybe, maybe I can add something to that question. Uh, from a security point of view, it's maybe not the best idea to give all users in a confluence environment the access right to uh, write queries and converter functions. This should be limited to a uh, few people in the organization. Yeah, that's true. <laughs> Okay, another another question from the audience. So then I would I would have one. Um, okay. Another security question. You ask for the uh, username and password for the data source. Um, right. Yeah. Do you store these encrypted somewhere? <laughs> that's. Uh, um, yeah, that's it's a really hard um, it's a really hard problem because at the time of sending the request, we of course need them in plain text, right? Mm -hmm. Um, so right now in the current version, um, they're not stored encrypted, unfortunately, but we're working on that and we want to update it. Um, but as I said, it's a really hard problem because um, we would have to store the key somewhere as well and storing it encrypted and storing the key right next to it is kind of like storing it plain text. 
either way. <laughs> so mm -hmm. it's, it's really not an easy problem to solve because we need to be uh, able to use the passwords at runtime in plain text. Okay, so a recomm recommendation would basically be create a separate user for these queries. And yeah, and so since Poggy query is read-only anyway, it would be a good idea to create a read-only user anyway, so that can't be abused. And if you're working with REST APIs, prefer tokens over something like basic auth, um, so the standard security applies, but yeah. Okay. Um, I have another question. Um, are you thinking about um, allowing users to script a query, so administrators to script a query so that they do not have to click through your interface so they can write just write a script for the whole query and upload, a, put, I don't know, JSON, whatever, and then um, something processes that. Because I know um, a lot of people who like to write that stuff down mm -hmm. instead of clicking through an interface. Yeah, say. sure. I mean, <laughs> the REST API the public uses internally, of course, isn't documented. So it's, pr and it, of course, could change at any time. So that's probably not a good idea. But what you could do is there's an import mechanism in Pocket Query. So you can, um, you could export a query and have a look at what the XML looks like. And you could just generate a query um, in XML format and use the import endpoint of Pocket Query because that should basically never change, or at least the, the path of it shouldn't change. So you could generate XML and upload it through the import endpoint. That, that should work, yeah. Okay, perfect. Um, my last question. Um, Currently, Pocket Query is available for server and data center, if I saw that correctly. Uh, any mm -hmm. plans for cloud? Yeah, we're, we're actually working on it. Um, I think it's the, usually, the usual answer that you get from a vendor if you ask about cloud. It's just a lot of work. Like, <laughs> we have to rewrite the whole thing. And uh, storing the passwords thing, the security stuff, is, of course, even more crucial in cloud. Um, so we want to have that solved before we go live. And um, of course, there's also kind of a difference. So we already have a prototype, um, I can say that. But um, of course, in the cloud, um, you would have to open your database to the internet, or at least to our servers to be accessible from the internet. So there's just, there's certain aspects that are more that are harder to solve in the cloud. So it's still going to take some time probably, but yeah, it's coming. <laughs> okay. I have another one. Do you have for your uh, resources? So uh, for the data connections, do you have an overview, which ones are working and which are not of the resources you put in? So if you put the data source in and somebody changes the API, that's for, uh -huh. for example, like our, uh, we have like teams which handle the API and they modify it and then they want to adjust their query in uh, Confluence, for example, in order to have mm. an updated query there. But like, is there some way where we have like, for example, like for the administrators, like all the uh, you know, and see which ones are failed? You, you could write a pocket query that does this. <laughs> So in Pocket Query, there's um, there's no way to do it, but you could um, you could write a query or let's say rather a template probably that executes all queries and lists them in a table and shows you which ones worked and which ones not. But that table would of course uh, it might take very long to initialize because you need to execute all the queries, right? <laughs> mm. So you could build something like that for yourself. But in Pocket Query, there's I don't think there's a feature like that right now, no. But that's a cool idea, yeah. So, yeah. I think I'm, I'm actually going to write that down, maybe. <laughs> uh, we, can, we can get you in contact after the presentation. Yeah, sure. To, that, and, would be, uh, that would be cool, yeah. Frank, would that be okay with you? That we yeah, uh, sure. Okay, I have perfect. still a contact tomorrow for the other thing. Ah, okay. <laughs> We are creating features all over the globe <laughs> currently. Um, <laughs> any other questions from the audience? Okay, then, then I have another one. Um, the, this, these pages are dynamic, so the data is displayed 
or is mm -hmm. or, or do you keep a temporary temporary copy of the data in Confluence somewhere? Or how is that working? I don't I try to understand. So if I if I open the page, if I refresh the page, mm -hmm. uh, the query is executed and the data is in my browser. Where is it? Yeah. So. It's a data mediator, right? That's, yeah. that's what I tried to explain at the start. So every time that you execute the PokeQuery macro, the request is made to the external data source. There is an exception. You could enable a cache on a query, and then the query result would be cached and stored in the confluence memory, right? But um, the standard case is that every time that you execute a query, a request is made to the external service. And does the data it, is in the page in your browser, yeah. Okay. Does it also work with the Lucene part? Uh, you, you marked like one for being in the search context. Mm -hmm. uh, so this is like only the context there is like only updated when this site is viewed, right? Um, the way that that works is that there is a background shop. So for my demo, I increase, uh, I let the job run every 15 seconds. Usually I think it runs uh, every hour or every night or something. And uh, this job actually adds the query results to the Lucene index. So there will also be query results even if, um, even if the page wasn't looked at recently or something like that. Ah, cool. And it wipes out the old ones, right? Yeah. I think so, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, any other questions from the audience? Going once. Going <laughs> twice. And gone. So with that, again, thank you, Sven, for the presentation. And... Um, just as a reminder that we will include URLs to all the things that we discussed um, in the show notes. So um, you will find all that um, in YouTube. And please follow us on Twitter, join our Atlassian community group, and or subscribe to YouTube, to our YouTube channel to receive timely updates uh, about the publication of this recording and all our other activities. So next week, we will hear from resolutions Christian Reichert and Björn Döhler why passwords suck and discuss the latest trends and challenges in user management. Uh, we are, of course, a partner of No Cabin Fever today, no.cabin-fever.today, uh, where you can find a talk every day, 4 p.m., to learn something about the Atlassian ecosystem. And last but not least, next week, Thursday, will be the first of a new series of virtual breakfasts with Lean Coffee where we want to talk with you about anything and everything that is on your minds right now. And we are looking forward to seeing you there. With that, have a nice evening, a great week, a spectacular weekend, and see you again next Monday. Thanks again, Sven, for the presentation. Uh, stay safe and good night. Thank you for having me. Bye.